Hello there, Holly here from the School of Earth Australia and welcome to part two of our Discover Elasmorank series. So part one is on the anatomy and physiology of sharks and in this lesson we're going to look at the fear surrounding our sharks and also look at some of the threats that they face. So we're going to start with a thought experiment. Now if you search for shark related articles on the, on the internet, what are some of the emotive words that they use to describe the shark or the incident and how do these words make you feel? Do you think that the word choices are justified? And how do you feel about the phrase shark attack? So let's talk about sharks in the media. Now our toothy friends are often cast as the villain within the movie world. And most of us have seen the movie Jaws. It was a summer blockbuster filled with suspense filled scenes that saw a generation develop an irrational fear of sharks. Now it isn't just the movie world where sharks are portrayed in a negative light. The media loves to use fear tactics when covering shark sightings and in the unfortunate and saddening event when somebody does get bitten. The headlines for such broadcasts often use words like vicious, man-eater and monster. These adjectives are used to invoke an emotional response from us. And most often than not, that response is fear or resentment. So let's have a look at why we fear things. Now fear is a very important important survival instinct and it isn't something that we should ignore however we can change our attitude and behavior towards it now usually we fear things that we don't understand or things that are unknown the way in which most of the public perceive our sharks is based on a misunderstanding and this misunderstanding breeds fear a great way to tackle fear is to learn more about it and deepen our understanding of the things that frighten us so before Frank learned about prawns, he thought they were these red-eyed, terrifying, evil creatures that roamed the oceans. But after Frank learned about prawns, he realised that they really weren't that scary at all. So his new knowledge changed the way in which he saw them. So sharks is a predator. Now sharks are an apex predator and it's really important that we don't forget that. They are top the top of the marine food chain and they help to keep ocean ecosystems in balance and we rely on those healthy oceans in order to survive. Now they evolved over 400 million years ago to be powerful and versatile carnivores and they really haven't changed that much over that period of time. Now like any apex predator, this title and role should be respected and protected. When we swim or surf in the ocean, we are putting ourselves into a shared zone with our aquatic animals. And sharks often swim along the steep drop-offs or between sandbars with it near the shore line. So the Australian Shark Attack File, or the a ASAF, is a way to standardise reporting of incidents of shark and human interactions. And it was developed in Australia in 1980. Now in 2020 the ASF investigated 27 reported incidents of human and shark interactions, and we can see the statistics below. Now, we've divided them up into states. So how many total incidents were there in your state? That'll be next to the blue dot. The red dot represents the number of those incidents that were fatal. The orange dot is those that were, un that were injured, and the green dot is those that were uninjured. Now, they also divide them up into unprovoked, and provoked encounters. So an unprovoked encounter between a shark and human it is defined as an incident where a shark is in its natural habitat and has made a determined attempt to bite a human without the human provoking the shark. A provoked encounter is when a human attracts or initiates physical contact with the shark. So that could be spearfishing or diving, grabbing a shark, taking a shark off a hook, um, and the uninjured category usually represents just a bump or bite to a surfboard where the person was not injured. Perspective. It is really important that we put shark encounters into perspective. So on average, 87 people drown at Australian beaches each year. Yet there have been, on average, only 1.1 fatalities per year from shark and human interactions over the past two decades. Therefore, the risk of a shark encounter is extremely low. Additionally, from the 1930s to now, the number of fatal incidents relative to the total number of incidents has also decreased from 45% in the 1930s to 10% in the past decade. So the percentage of fatalities per year relative to the total number of incidents is 10%.
we're actually more likely to win the lottery twice than we are to have a negative encounter with a shark. More people are injured by office chairs, toilets and falling coconuts than they are sharks. Now, one of the great ways that you can be a little bit more shark smart when you go to the beach is download the Shark Smart app. So it combines shark activity information, beach safety features such as life saving, um, and it allows you to plan your trip to the beach a little better. So you'll be able to see where there are shark nets, where there are the smart drum lines, where there have been sharks lo- um, spotted um, through drones, and you can also see any tag sharks that have gone near the acoustic towers. So let's have a look at the threats to elasmobranchs. So this is just a quick little sciencey one, fish versus fishes. So we use the word fish as a collective noun for a group of sp- fish of one species. So a whole bunch of sardines, they are fish. Fishes is the collective noun for a group of multiple species. So in this one, we have a tuna, a shark and a sardine. Therefore, we would say fishes. So elasmobranchs are incredibly diverse, and after all, they have been swimming in our oceans for over 400 million years, since before the dinosaurs, and in fact, there are some shark fossils that predate trees. Now, sharks have survived all the mass extinction events that have taken place on Earth, which is a pretty amazing um, thing to have done. Now, there are currently over 500 known species of shark and over 600 known species of ray alone, and Australia is the shark and ray capital. Of, the, of the, all the known species of shark, Australia is home to over 200 of them. And many of these species are endemic to Australia, meaning they can only be found in Australian waters. So let's have a look again at that role as an apex predator. So the food chain begins with tiny microscopic plants called phytoplankton. Now these primary producers provide us with 70% of the oxygen that we breathe. These tiny plants are eaten by primary consumers called zooplankton, which are in turn eaten by smaller fish and the smaller fish are eaten by bigger fish and so on. Now elasmobranchs are upper level predators. Some like our great white are apex predators, meaning that they're right at the top of the food chain, while others like stingrays are called mesopredators. This means they feed on smaller fish, but bigger fish and marine mammals also feed on them. So as upper level predators, elasmobranchs have a strong influence on the trophic levels below them. Can you see how elasmobranchs help keep the oceans in equilibrium? If there were too many of them and their prey numbers, their prey numbers will dwindle, which can lead to an explosion of phytoplankton that can cause toxic blooms. If there are too few, their prey numbers will increase and this will decimate the primary producers, which provides us with most of the oxygen that we breathe. So we can see in this left hand one here, there's too many sharks. That means we're going to see a reduction in the number of tuna, which means that there's nothing for to feed on the squid. So their numbers will explode. That means that they will annihilate all of the trophic level below them. So the little prawns that they eat will disappear and we see a massive bloom in phytoplankton. Over here, if the shark disappeared, we have a thriving population of tuna. But all those tuna have got to eat this squid, which means that squid's population is going to decline, which means that prawn population is going to explode and they're going to eat all the phytoplankton. So what would happen if sharks disappeared? Now, food webs are not quite as simple as big fish eat smaller fish. They are incredibly complex and it's almost impossible for us to predict what would happen if we remove this apex predator from the ocean food chain. What we do know is that This isn't something that we should be willing to risk. It's really important that we pretend, uh, protect our bendy boned friends so that we don't lose this wonderful ocean ecosystem. So sharks today. Now the sad reality is that our sharks and rays are threatened and their numbers are declining. It is estimated that almost one third of all shark and ray species are threatened with extinction, meaning they could disappear from our oceans forever. Complicating this, almost 40% of all crudicthine fish listed on the IUCN red list of threatened species are considered data deficient. Now that means that we don't actually have enough information or enough statistics to make a prediction on their population numbers. Now that's really, really scary. 
So what are the threats that elasmobranchs face? Now, elasmobranchs are found all over the world and in a varied habitats, and therefore many species face a variety of different threats. For example, our large body coastal species are at the highest risk because they are closer to human activity. When we talk about the big four threats faced by elasmobranchs, we are talking about fishing, habitat modification, marine pollution, and climate change. Now, combined, these threats impact every single species of elasmobranch. So let's have a look at fishing. Now, fishing has an important social and economic importance. However, if not appropriately managed, managed, it can have a huge impact on our environment. So many sharks are directly targeted by small scale and commercial scale fishing. Persecution or control programs, which often follow incidents such as shark bites, account for 4% of shark and ray deaths. Now, elasmobranchs aren't only impacted by direct fishing. They are also indirect impacts from fishing. In fact, 96% of elasmobranchs are threatened by the indirect effects of commercial fishing. And this includes things like loss of prey or their habitat. Now, shark finning is a pretty cruel act where we chop the fins off a shark and throw it back. Now, many of our larger shark species, like our white shark, breathe via something called ram ventilation which means they need to keep swimming in order to breathe so if we chop off their fins and throw them back sadly they're going to drown now shark fin soup is considered a delicacy and it is estimated that 191 sharks are killed every 60 seconds for their fins habitat modification now, there are many ways that habitats can be modified, and again, there are direct and indirect threats. These are some of the key processes that result in habitat modification for our aquatic species, ranked from the highest to the lowest threat level. Development, so deconstruction of their critical habitats, recreational activities, oil and gas drilling or exploration, aquaculture and shipping lanes. Now, in general, coastal species are more exposed to threats from habitat destruction than our deep water species because they are simply closer to the activity. Marine pollution is another big one. Now, it isn't just plastic pollution that is an issue. It's also pollution from urban wastewater, liquid waste or sewage um, discharged into river. And of course, then we've got our plastic pollution. Now, it's estimated that about 6% of elasmobranchs are threatened by pollution. Pollution can make habitats unsuitable for species to live in and, may, and many toxic um, chemicals are then exposed to these animals. Um, and that can often lead to them dying or becoming really injured. Now, upper level predators like our sharks actually bioaccumulate lots of nasty chemicals in their flesh. For example, mercury builds up in shark flesh, which is why it's not a great idea to eat too much shark meat. Climate change is another one. So warming air temperatures means warming ocean temperatures. And a warming ocean is disastrous for coral reefs and the species which rely on these ecosystems as well as it may also make habitats unsuitable for many species so ocean acidification um, it's basically the ocean becoming more acidic so this scale that you can see here is a ph scale so anything below seven is considered acidic and anything above seven is considered an alkaline now, the ocean generally sits at about 8.1, but what we're seeing is as carbon dioxide um, goes into the ocean, it is converted into carbonic acid, which is obviously an acid, and that then starts to increase the acid of, uh, acidity of the ocean. Now, things like our coral reefs and other animals that rely on calcium carbonate skeletons, like crabs, this raise in um, acidity is really, really bad for them. The other thing is that obviously as the temperatures on Earth rise, it means that the ocean starts to change temperature and we will also see sea level rise from melting ice. So climate change is really not great, not just for sharks, but for all our marine species. So if you would like to learn more about the threats or more about our 
Alas Ranks. We have actually written a book that you can download. If you scan the QR code here, it is available as an ebook so that we're not using any paper. Um, and you can learn all about our Elasmobranch species and hopefully we answer all of the questions that you might have about Elasmobranchs. Now, the next uh, video will be on shark conservation. So all of the things that you can do at home to help to protect our toothy friends. Now, if you have really enjoyed this video, don't forget to like it and subscribe to our channel. Hope you guys have a fantastic day. Thanks so much.